Everybody having a good week this week? Amen. There's no such thing as a bad week with God. <laughs> and it doesn't mean you can't have bad circumstances, but you don't get to have bad weeks. You know, there's a difference, difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is dependent on circumstances. Joy is not. Happiness is dependent on everything's going my way. Got a good job, got a good car. But joy, joy is a fruit of the Spirit. See, joy is based in things not seen. It's based in Him. See, and you can count it all joy. Whether you're driving a rust bucket <laughs> or whatever you got. Praise God. I remember when we used to drive rust buckets. <laughs> And then you count it all joy. God, God blessed us, amen. I did not have the money to pay for those things, but God provides. I don't know why I'm on that, but I want to teach on that a little bit. That's not what I have here. I think we will get what, to what I have here, but do you know following God requires trust? Everybody say trust. Trust is something that is developed and cultivated over time. See, you don't, uh, you don't leap into trust with somebody you don't know, right? That's foolish. See, one of the best examples of this is a human relationship, especially a romantic relationship. And uh, I'm not saying, this might be dangerous, I'm not saying quick relationships can't work. I'm sure they have, they do sometimes. I'm just saying it's exceedingly risky <laughs> because you haven't developed trust. You haven't spent a lot of time getting to know the ins and outs of that person. I can remember dating Natalie and we had been dating a year and a half and I think we've, we ended up, I knew her, I knew her for a year and a half before we started dating and then we dated for two and a half years. So I had three, four years of experience with her. Year, I was ready to date within the first month, but she was not. <laughs> she was a little skittish, so you know you had to. She had her guard up coming to school, so on. She says, "Oh, we're not here to date anybody." You know, <laughs> like, okay. It's a challenge. I get it. <laughs> and. Uh, so I had a year and a half of getting to know her outside of a dating relationship. And then we had two and a half years to get to know each other after that. And, and then by that time, we were ready to, to get engaged. Okay. See, trust takes time. And even I can remember being knowing her for a year and a half, two, three years after I'd met her the first time, knowing her that long. And there was a couple things you, you get surprised. You're like, what is this? <laughs> you know, who is this person that I thought I knew? You know, it takes time. That's why marriage is so important. And it's so important that you, you found it on trust. <clears throat> and uh, we, have, uh, we have a relationship with God. And it takes time. Now, he knows who he is. He is who he is. But we started out no matter who you are, you started out as a child of the world, not a child of God. And I love the spirit of those boards that try and say, you know, they'll say we're all, I've read Christian authors say we're all the children of God. No, we're all the creation of God. We're all the creation of God. But you're a child of the world because of what Adam did. Sin is natural to you. You know, perverse thinking is natural to you. What, you know, what God would call good, you would call bad. All right? And so, when you get born again, you become a child of God, and it is retraining you out of, out of who you were as a child of the world. What the, chi what the world teaches you, um, uh, survival, the strong, survival the fittest, who's ever strongest wins, you know, whoever's got the most, mo most money, most connections, work your way up the, the, the ladder of life, Fight and scrap for everything you have. It's my way. It's my kingdom. It's my life. I'm building it for me. This is what the world teaches. 
Well, you get born again. What Jesus says and the way Jesus walked flies in the face of what the world teaches. And Jesus said, take no thought. Except for in extreme situations. No, he said, take no thought what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat. Okay? He says, God will provide for the birds. How much more better are you to him? So there is a retraining that has to take place. And it's, that's why Paul says, he says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, it takes a renewing of the mind. It's a process to renew your mind to the place where you start trusting God to be your father because you never used to. And there are so many Christians that are robbed of this wonderful advantage of just rest. Rest is what we, the Sabbath day in the Old Testament was type and shadow. You're not called to keep a literal Sabbath anymore. It was type and shadow of what the rest was supposed to be in all creation that you, were, you would enter into. You're a child of God. And Jesus, he, he, he kept the Sabbath day as a Jew for, the, for, for fulfillment of the law. But I guarantee you, he was in Sabbath all the time. Because he was resting in the fact that he was a child of God. And, he, and in John, it says, to them gave he power to become the sons of God that believe on his name. Well, that's me. I believe on his name, don't I? Yeah. And so I can enter into that same rest, Hebrews says. And that part of that rest Part of that rest is relaxing and letting him be provider for you and not you provider for yourself. Now, that doesn't mean we don't work. That doesn't mean you don't, you're not a hard worker, you don't have a job. That does mean you're not ultimately working for your employer. If that job goes, he has another one. If one stream dries up, there's another one. He's going to take care of you, whether it's however it comes, whether it's through one avenue and that door shuts, you get, you know, you get fired. Why is it the end of the world if you get fired? You're working for your father. See, He has what you need. And I've been prompted a couple times to share this more, so I'm just going to share. I try and keep it to myself because uh, I'm boasting in God. I'm not boasting in what I have. Amen. I can, I, we, we drove a, a, you know, it was a 15-year-old Chrysler Concorde. And I, we didn't have a lot of money saved, okay? And, and you got a family of f- five, and, and, uh, and I've, we've just been trusting God. We're not out to, to make our own way. We're trusting him, amen? And so I didn't have a lot of money. We needed a minivan. Now, I have a good credit record, okay? I'm responsible. I could have gone out and got, it a, a, got a $9,000 loan, no problem. They would have given me a money I could have gotten a van I could have taken matters into my own hand but the Lord told me at one point he said he said when you need a new car it'll be there for you and so I never felt uneasy (laughs) I never I, I could have gone and done that I could have solved it never thought about it again but I can remember this has been now what has it been has it been two and a half maybe two and a half maybe almost three years I think it's two and a half years. Two and a half years ago, we were driving that, that rust bucket home, and, uh, and it started shuddering real bad, and I don't even know what was wrong with it. You know, the book value on that thing's not but $1,000, and you, you just know some of the symptoms. You're like, this is going to be more than $1,000. <laughs> and so it just was shuddering and sputting around, and, <clears throat> and it's like, we can't, re- this is our only car, you know. I use mom's truck here and there to do work if I have to, but, but that, we can't haul the three kids around in a, in a truck. Okay. And so I, I remember I was driving home, and I said, Lord, I thank you. You meet all my needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I thank you that, that, you, that you have everything I need. That Thank you for this car, how good it's been for as long as we've had it. It's been a blessing. It's working. Thank you, Father, that we have everything. I just did that all the way home. <laughs> you know, circumstances, not, not necessarily happy with the car, okay? <laughs> but counting it all joy, right? And you put that into practice, it starts to change your mentality. And it wasn't a week or two. Somebody, we had put it before the Lord years ago. It was like, you know, if we had to pick an ideal van, 
an ideal van. I, we would want a Honda Odyssey with you know, leather seats, moonroof, you know, and a video player for the kids. And I, and I even then when I prayed that, I was like, Lord, I'm not trying to be greedy. I'm just saying that's my ideal, you know. And, uh, and I looked them up. They're like, if you buy them brand new, they're 40 grand, right? And so I didn't know how that was going to happen. We're just following God. And I, and I remember, and these people had no idea that that was the van we were looking for. No idea. And they had had it. They drove it up. Through, they, they are good friends. We go visit them maybe a couple times a year, three and a half hours away. They live in Dubuque. And they drove that van up to our door, and they came into our house. And they says, we have a gift for you. And they set down two, two travel coffee mugs, you know, on the table, and they put a key next to it. And I said, what is this? And out of the blue, we says, let's go outside. And we went outside. And there is our Honda Odyssey, 2013 moonroof. Has, it has uh, leather seats, which you do need with kids. Otherwise, they're going to tear them <laughs> to pieces. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and it had a, a DVD player. I mean, just everything. And I just got that, and I was just got that key in my hand. And I was just shaking, because I, you know, God is good, and He is a provider, and He'll take care of you. He'll take care of you. And and I know I could have solved the problem, would have shut that door right right in God's face. But see, how much I would rather walk through things with him and learn who he is and receive from him and get to trust him more like me and my spouse trust each other more than to try and do it my own way and find out at the end of my life I could have had something way better because he's better than I am at taking care of stuff. Same. Now there come a day where, you know, if we were to, we, we've never gotten in a car accident in all the years we lived here. Well, Natalie did once, but <laughs> never mind. But if we were to get in a car wreck with that van, see, how I got it, I know how I got it. I got it from him. And, in, and if I need something else, he'll give me something else. That's why Jesus, when he was saying, why, why do you go to law and why do, you sue, why do you sue your brother? Why do you try and take, he says, if somebody takes your coat, just give him something else. Give him love. And you trust, your God, trust God to meet all of your needs. And it's in that context, he says, blessed down, shaken together, running over, men will give back to you. And what he's saying there, he's not talking about an offering. He's talking about a way of life that if people come and try and rob you or steal you or do you wrong or they take your investment money or they steal whatever you have, you love them anyway. And if, you're in, if you care more about them than you do about the stuff they took, he says, I'll cause men to give back to you a hundredfold. That's what he's saying there. Because the language that God is trying to speak to everybody is not stuff. It's love. It's his love. Everybody say amen to that. Amen. amen. Well, that was a good mini sermon. I think it's 11, 1120. <laughs> I pray that blessed you. And there's, you know, trust is something that continues to grow. And what I've trusted him for in the past are not the things we're trusting him for now. See, ideally, they're supposed to be bigger things. That's what faith is. See? The whole idea of transformation is that you would follow God and trust him. Another word for trust is have faith. To have faith in him to move bigger and bigger mountains out of your life. And then, see... Most, most Christian walk is so focused on God getting mountains out of your life, but the end goal is not that. It's to get mountains out of other people's lives. It's to know your God and be free of yourself, and then you can go get mountains out of other people's lives. That's what, that's what faith is. And see, Paul was walking. Why we looked, I looked to Paul is because he didn't know Jesus personally in the sense that he didn't walk with him physically, but he knew him through the relationship with the Holy Ghost. Everybody say amen to that. The Holy Ghost has come to be your teacher. That's what Jesus said. <clears throat> he has come to teach you, lead you, and guide you into all truth. And so the Holy Ghost is, was Paul's lifeline 
of all of the revelation, all the revelation you see recorded. Now, I don't doubt maybe he was able to get a hold of some of the accounts of the Gospels. You know, he, got, he knew Peter, he knew the, the apostles. I don't doubt that he got to read Jesus' teachings. But he says, I didn't receive this Gospel from any man. I received it from, from God. See, and the Holy Ghost is sent exp- for that same reason to, to teach each and every one of you the Gospel. And we take for granted we have this book in our hands, right? We can open it up and read to whatever we want. But do you know, do you know that um, the early church, they might have had one or two letters from Paul, maybe a copy of one of the Old Testament scriptures. They didn't have this. I mean, your average individual probably couldn't even read. See, and how does God get around the logistical challenges of teaching people that don't have this? that can't even read. See, it's the Holy Spirit that's sent for each and every individual that those that spend time in prayer and fellowship with Him, they receive from God on a personal, individual level. This is what the fulfillment of the prophecy was, was that it's not going to be every man teaching each other. It's going to be, I will be a God to this people and every man will be taught by me. That's what the Holy Ghost came to do. And even in those early years, where I'm so grateful this was put together, but do you know the Holy Ghost was able to work in that early church when nobody had one of these? Why? Because the Holy Spirit was working in their hearts and their minds through the prayer that they were praying, through their relationship with God, through praying in the Spirit. Paul said, everybody say Paul. Paul says, I thank God I pray in tongues more than you all. Well, why? (laughs) He that prays in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, not unto men, unto God. In the spirit, he's speaking mysteries. Mysteries to God? No. No mysteries to you. What purpose to be revealed? And he wrote them down. And now we have them. And the same Holy Ghost is wanting to reveal to you, to teach you, to talk to you, to share with you, not just what this means, but also what your calling is, what your life is. He gives, he'll give you those little words in your life. It was him. It was the Holy Spirit that brought the mind of Christ to me that says, when you need a new car, it'll be there for you. I was in the middle of looking through Craigslist for cars. He says, why are you, it's a waste of time. Why are you spinning your wheels? <laughs> Let me take care of that. I'm your, I'm your father. See, he'll teach you. He'll learn. He'll teach you trust. He'll learn you trust. <laughs> Amen. Well, I want to start out reading a verse. <laughs> We've already started, I know. <laughs> uh, but I want to read a verse. Let's go to Mark 11. Mark 11, verse 20. I believe we're going to be talking about strongholds today. Now, before I read this, I just want to kind of preface what I'm, what I'm about to read with, with this image. You know, the Old Testament, it says in Hebrews that the Old Testament is types and shadows, okay? It's the shadow of the new. So what you see recorded in the Old Testament are images and pictures that are supposed to be almost like living parables, and they were real people that follow God, but they were living parables of the truths of the new, okay? So God's people in the Old Testament was Israel. And when Israel was delivered from Egypt, see, they came out of Egypt, they came out of bondage, okay, natural physical bondage, and they were free. And this is this is a type and shadow of what Jesus did for humanity. We didn't come out of necessarily a natural physical bondage, we came out of spiritual bondage. We were children of the world, and he, he opened the door and led us out of captivity, just like Moses was a type and shadow of Christ, all right? So when the children of God, who were the Israelites at that time, they had a covenant with God. They left Egypt, and they went into the desert with Moses. Moses, the ultimate goal of God was not to leave them in the desert. It was to take them to the promised land. 
See, so God had a promised land in the Old Testament, a land of rest, a land of rejuvenation that flowed with milk and honey. See, God had that prepared for them. That was always in God's mind. That was God's intent. That was God's will. Everybody say will. will. It was God's will to bring the children of Israel out of that and into the promised land. Okay. Now, you all know that story because we've talked on it so many times. Okay. But that first group that came to the edge of the promised land, in spite of all that they'd seen, in spite of seeing the, the, all of the, the miracles that God did to get them free, which was impossible. The miracles that God did to keep them uh, taken care of and provided for, water flowing from rocks, manna falling from heaven, uh, all of the things that God did to take care of the Israelites. And they got up to the promised land and they were not able to, to receive it. Even though God's will was that they would, right? So let's, let's get beyond this predestination thing where God's will will always happen regardless, okay? Because he wanted them to go and they couldn't or they didn't because they, it says in Hebrews, they had in them an evil heart of unbelief. What was the unbelief? He, God gave them the word and he says, go and take the land. I've given you the land. And they went and spied it out. They saw all of the people groups in there, okay? All of the mighty, mighty, uh, uh, I don't know all of the names, the Phil, you know, I'm not going to get it right, so I'm not even going to try. <laughs> but about all of those groups, those ites, the ites that were in the land, all right? And, and they went and saw them and says, we're, we're, they came back with this report, okay? Now, facts are not evil, all right? There's nothing wrong with facts. Facts are the way things are. What is evil is on the basis of facts saying God's wrong. That's what's evil. There's, I have no, doctors are supposed to, they are supposed to give you the facts. I want my doctor, if I have cancer, I want my doctor to tell me, you have cancer. I want to know. Better I know, right? Can't beat the mountain if we don't know what it is. Can't, sticking your head in the sand is not faith. That's not faith. Ignoring symptoms is not faith, Okay. Now, you, you have your own walk with God. I'm just telling you, I've seen people die because they thought they were in faith and they were ignoring symptoms, okay? I want to know the facts. Evil is not facts. What is evil is when you take the facts and with your heart and your emotions and your mind, you say, I don't believe God can do anything about it. That's evil. And see, it was not wrong what they came back with when they said there are giants in the land were grasshoppers in their sight, we're not as big of mighty of people as there. They have walls, you know, when they finally do good in there, you know, Jericho. Jericho was so big, chariots could go on top of it, you know. Strongholds, everybody say strongholds. strongholds. There were strongholds in the promised land. And when God told them to take it, they looked at all the strongholds and they says, God's wrong. Why? Because of the facts. Because of what they saw. They took what they saw and they interpreted it in their heart. And, and Hebrews says they had in them an evil heart of unbelief. Nothing they said was inaccurate except that they thought that they couldn't do it. And God said that they could. And that, that is evil. That's a stronghold in your heart. Well, what did God have them do? That generation did not inherit. That generation died off in the, is, um, in the wilderness. And, and the way we always say it around here is you can take the people out of Egypt, but you have to also take the Egypt out of the people. You have to take the unbelief out of the people. And, they, and the process that you see them walking through, going around in the desert, going around the mountain, going around you know, however many years it was until only Caleb and Joshua, who were the beginning, they were, let me put it to you a different way. Caleb and Joshua, weren't they the only ones that had a good report and said, yeah, that's all true, but God said we could do it. That is a type and shadow of Christ on the inside of you. It's who you've been made to be. That is your spirit. It's created in righteousness and true holiness. And the moment you get born again, God puts the life of Christ on the inside of you in, inside all of this flesh. <laughs> inside all of these uh, unbelieving Israelites. Inside of all of this stronghold. See? And and. In that moment, 
God puts his life on the inside of you and it's his express purpose that that life transform to the newness of the mind, the nature of Christ on the inside of you, that what used to be is no longer what will be. That's the whole goal, okay? And that's why Paul says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In several places, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. What does that mean? In other words, you're letting the spirit on the inside of you retrain and order your life in a new way that the old man in your life didn't, see? And so, you have, you have in a, almost in a seed, like when you plant a seed in the ground, Caleb and Joshua were the seed of belief of the Spirit in the Israelite people. And it was only them, wasn't it only them that lasted until they went and saw that? They were the only two out of that whole company that survived that track in the wilderness to enter the promised land because they had believed it. Now, during that track in the promised land, every single person that did not believe that they could go do it, they died off. That old, that old generation died off, and everybody that was left was a new group of people that believed they could follow, and they followed God into the promised land. Well, let me put it to you this way. It's almost as if Joshua and Caleb, over time, transformed that whole group of people into a single united body that believed they could do what God could do. God said they could do. Everybody see that picture? Well, they entered into the promised land and then they have to take on Jericho. See, they, that group went into Jericho. Now see, not by might, not by power, but by his spirit, Zechariah says, right? By his spirit. The way that you walk in your new life is not the way you walk in your old life. Now look, if you're gonna wage a war, you don't walk around it. You don't shout at it. You count how many spears you have. You count how many men you have. Do you, do you need some kind of uh, catapult to break down those walls? What do we gotta do to, to invade this city? See what, and, and the whole point, the whole picture of this is that God was with them wherever they went and they didn't go by in their own strength, they went with God's strength. And they followed God's instructions. And you can mock whatever you want, but they, you know, I'm sure they were being mocked as they walked around Jericho and as they blow their horns in victory. But on that seventh day, didn't the walls come down? Didn't it come down? And they had their victory, see? Well, see, what was an Old Testament picture is a shadow of what God is giving you in the New Testament. See, we're not, oh. Paul said, he says, we don't fight with flesh and blood. We don't fight against flesh and blood. That's perfect parallel against what happened in the Old Testament. That's exactly what they did. They fought with flesh and blood. Okay. Everybody in Mark chapter 11, I wanna give you a vision of what the promised land looks like for us Christians. Because it's not a physical land. It's not grapes as big as your hand. It's not natural provision. Now, if you want a more comprehensive view of what your promised land looks like, you can read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because Jesus' life is your inheritance. He is your pattern. He's the mark that we strive for. That's what Paul said. People that say, uh, people that say that you, you know, you can, you can try and be like Christ, but you're never going to be like Christ. You know, you can't actually, you can't actually be like Christ, really. You know, we just do our best in this kind of humble effort. Okay, that's a lie. God gave Jesus as a pattern for us to walk by, to, ex to be an example to, and to strive towards that mark. Paul says, I press on. I leave those things that are behind and I press on to the high mark of the calling of Christ Jesus. That's everybody's calling. It's for you and me, okay? Now, you can read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can look at the life of Christ. That's, that's your inheritance, freedom, Joy in any circumstance, no matter what hits you, you can overcome it. In the same way that he was given authority, he says, I give them authority. 
See? So what, what, what impedes us receiving that life? What, what impedes us using that authority? What impedes us receiving, you know, in the Old Testament? Well, I want those grapes. I want those grapes in the, in the promised land. Well, you have to take the land. You have to, you have to defeat the enemy that's in that camp to receive those. You have to take the land. See, and in the Old Testament, it was a stronghold of natural, natural things. Now we have strongholds that are not seen, but they're unseen on the inside. See, I just want to read this. Everybody say, Jesus said. Jesus. This is something Jesus said. If you don't like it, you can talk to him. It applies to me and it applies to you. And I don't care how much religion tells me otherwise. Okay. Mark 11, verse 20. And this is that parable, or this is the, the picture of the fig tree. And we won't teach on what that means today, but I want you to see what he says to Peter. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. And Jesus answering, saith unto them, have faith in God. Remember, say trust. trust. Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever, <laughs> notice it says whosoever. You can take about 80% of denominations and they'll say, they will say, that this doesn't apply to you what I'm about ready to read. But Jesus said, everybody say Jesus said. Jesus he said, whosoever, whosoever. I mean, he could have said, he could have said, you 12. He didn't. He said, whosoever. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Where's the wiggle room in that? Everybody say promised land. Promise. See. Why, why, why don't we see that? Because there's ites. Because there's strongholds. Because there's things to yet be conquered. See. I mean, there's, that's just incredible, this statement. It's almost like if you read that in church, it's like, that's nice. You don't believe it, though. You don't believe it. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, so he one-ups it, you're talking about a tree, I'll, I'll, what about that mountain? I'll talk about the mountain. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. This is a law in the spirit. This is a law. Like, uh, oh, it's a good thing. Everybody knows what's gonna happen if I drop this? It'd be something if it stood there. <laughs> Prove me wrong. <laughs> What's going to happen if I drop this? What's the law in this world? Oh, there it goes. See? It's, it's a law. It's a law. It, it works on everybody the same way. All of you are being pulled by the same law at equal. Nobody, there is no respecter of persons with the law of gravity, right? Sometimes we wish there were <laughs> after holidays, you know, weigh a little less. <laughs> but see, it's the same law that applies to everyone. It's a law. There is no respecters of persons with the law of gravity, and there is no respecter of persons with God. And this is a law. Everybody say law. I heard that when I was in the I had to stop again. I've already read it twice, but I had whosoever, anybody, shall say unto this mountain, be removed, and, shall, and be thou cast in the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have so whatsoever he says. In other words, if all of those conditions line up, it's a law. It has to happen. Therefore, 
Look at this. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. And when you stand praying, now look, here's, here's some context to that, all right? When you stand praying, forgive. If you have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive you yours. Sin. There is a law in, in the Spirit that God has put in place, and it has something to do with, with your belief and your doubt in your heart. And it, this is our promised land. All right, now I'm just using this verse as an example. There's more. There's other things that Jesus has said. You need to have everything he said, not just this. If you have just this and you don't have everything else, you're gonna get out of balance. All right? This is not to serve your flesh with. This is to serve God with. All right? See? But this is a picture It is the promised land that each and every one of us has been given. And it's the strongholds in the Old Testament that oppose the will of God for the children of Israel. And it's the strongholds in the New Testament that oppose the will of God for his children today. And those strongholds are not out there. They're not your neighbor. Okay, it's not the job you have. You know, if I could just get a different job, you'd be the same person at another job. Well, I I hate this church. Well, you'll probably hate the next church too. (laughs) You know, you're the same wherever you go. You carry the same joy, the same defeat, the same fear, the same trust, whatever it is, you carry it with you. And it hits everyone. Anyway, I don't need to go down that rabbit trail. Hmm. Let's go to... Let's go to Romans chapter 2. Verse, uh, verse 14. And I'm just going to touch on this because we've, we've hit it so often, but what kind of, um, hmm. we haven't gotten to this verse yet, but uh, Paul says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. See, what's, what's the we- weapons that God has given you to overcome strongholds in your life? In the Old Testament, the weapons were carnal, weren't they? And in the New Testament, the weapons that we have are not. So what has God given us to overcome? The very first thing, the most important thing, is that you receive Jesus. And people, there is a strength that comes with the new birth that most of the church is unaware of. And it is the strength to say no to sin at will. I don't care how bad you think it is. It is the strength to say no to sin at will. And people think that because they commit sin, that somehow they didn't have a choice. But they did. How do I know that they did? Jesus said, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Now, we're going to touch on this. I'm just going to read this, but then I'm going to backtrack a bit. Okay. Verse 14 This is Paul. Paul is writing to a group of Jews, okay? And Paul, being an apostle of Gentiles, is putting the Gentiles up on a pedestal and saying, look at these Gentiles who never had the law. Look at this group of people that didn't know right from wrong. They weren't taught the Ten Commandments. They didn't grow up reading the Torah. They didn't know any of these things. He says, look at these Gentiles. Now look at what he says. He uses them to to show what God has done. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, they do by nature the things contained in the law. These having not the law are a law unto themselves. And this is a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. I will write the laws in their hearts and in their minds I'll write it. It's not going to be on tables of stone. It's going to be in their hearts and their minds. This was what the new birth came to do. Instead of looking at a law and saying, okay, I need to, on from the outside in, I need to change. God came and wrote the law in your heart and from the inside out, 
He expects to change. He has a foothold in the door. Do you see that? It's that Caleb and Joshua spirit in the door that's supposed to be conquering the land of your soul. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. And what is that mechanism when the law is in your heart? How many of you have received Christ? Yes? All right. The law is written in your heart. And that, now look, what is the mechanism that, how does that work? Their conscience, everybody say conscience. conscience. Their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or excusing. Accuse or excuse. In other words, you have been, you have been accused of wrongdoing. You are excused from wrongdoing, all right? When I pick up the word of God, my conscience excuses me of wrongdoing. When I go down and sit in front of the TV and something filthy comes on, my conscience accuses me of wrongdoing. See, that conscience, that law that's in your heart was not there before you got born again. It was given to you as part of the life of Christ. And that life of Christ speaks up. This is why when Nathan comes, he'll share, probably share his testimony again about how he went from a drug addict to getting born again, he went to sit down to smoke dope like he always did, and something popped up in his head and says, you're not like this anymore, put that down. And it took him a couple times of fighting it before he finally says, I can't do this anymore, I'm done. They'd go to lunch, you know, who he worked with, they went to lunch, they'd go to lunch at Hooters. He'd get to the door, and the Holy Ghost would tell, the, not the Holy Ghost, I'm sorry, the conscience, that part of you that's like Christ, says you're not, you're not like that anymore. You don't need to go in there. What you gonna find? You know what you're gonna find. See? He, he, he says, I'm sorry, I can't go in there. I'm gonna sit on the steps until you're done. See? That conscience will speak up and it will, see, that is step by step by the Spirit of God taking the land, saying no to sin instead of yes. And you think you don't have a right, you think everybody has a choice, okay? But if you say yes to something and you keep saying yes to it, you're only overriding the voice and you're just making it dull. Amen. Now, what I want to share about this is this. I can look back on my life. Here's, this is so good. This is something the Lord has been showing me. I can look back on my strongholds, okay? Everybody's got unique strongholds. You've got some, I've got some. I'm here to tell you, (laughs) your strongholds are not as powerful as what Jesus did. I don't care what they are. I don't care if it's crack cocaine or if it's eating too much sugar. I don't care. His blood was enough, isn't it? See, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. It's a law for everybody. It's, it's for you and it's for me and it's no respecter of persons, see? Now, I'm not saying every addiction is equal, but I'm saying that the cross is stronger. I'm saying that what he did on the inside is stronger. And every single stronghold that I have overcome or addiction that I have overcome, if you were to ask me, and especially in my younger years, in my youth, if you were to come ask me, I, I can see what the word of God says. I know the word of God says, you're free, right? It says it, all right? In, in Romans chapter five, it says, sin shall not have dominion over you. Is that plain enough? It shall not. Let's see, how many, of, how many Christians does sin still have dominion over in some facet? But Paul said, but Jesus said, well, what's the truth? Well, the facts, the facts seem more true to me now. What the word of God says is, is the truth, See, truth will change your facts. Truth is stronger than facts. Truth will take you out of whatever the facts are telling you at that moment. If you were to ask me in the middle of a stronghold when I'm dealing with something or if I'm addicted to something and I can look back and I can say, man, I know what the word of God says, but let me tell you what I feel. It feels like I can't change. Anybody ever had that feeling? It feels like this thing is stronger. It feels like what God said just isn't working for me. And how much of that get preached in the pulpits? 
they're preaching experience. They're preaching feelings. They're not preaching freedom or truth. They're not giving you the tools to change. They're kind of patting you on the back and saying, we're all there together. I appreciate the empathy, but give me something to go on. Because you can empathize with somebody and they'll never get any better. They, some people don't need a pat on the back. They need a kick in the butt. <laughs> See? <clears throat> and if you were to ask me in the middle of my strongholds, what's true? My heart at this moment, my feelings are so strong. This addiction is so strong. I don't, I feel like I'm, I'm not able to stop. All right, I, you know, whatever the thing is. And I can tell you on the other side that it's a lie. It's a lie. And, and it's with complete clarity. The more strongholds I conquer, I can look back and see my feelings were lying to me. My emotions, they would make such a fuss and such noise about, you can't ever be free from that. This is just for some people. This isn't what God has for you. You're always going to deal with this. It's a lie. It's a lie. And if you will stay attached to the truth of God's word, and if you will renew your mind, and if you will confess and believe and pray and fast and practice and do what the word says to do, you're going to walk out of what God says you can walk out of. You're going to be free because he has set you free. And the bottom line is, it's a choice. See, because before you got born again, you had no choice. The only resource you had on the inside was sin. And what came was the law that brought punishment for sin. So your, what was the bondage that they were in? When it says... Um, they, Paul called them the children of bondage. The bondage was, listen, I either listen to what's on the inside of my heart, which is sin, but if I, my only recourse is to look at the law, and that's punishment. So I'm stuck between living a life of sin and freedom or living a life of servitude and bondage, not true to what's on the inside. They were stuck. And God said, the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And see, now we live from the inside out and what you was once on the inside was wrong has been made right in Christ Jesus. And with your conscience, that law accuses or excuses every single action that crosses your path. Every single thought that comes across your path. It will accuse or excuse. It will take the promised land. And I'm telling you, I'm walking in more of the promised land than I used to because those things don't stop me anymore that used to. I used to hate and sit and pray and listen. I'm getting past it, amen? Because your, your flesh needs to learn to listen. Sit there. Just everybody say amen to that. All right. <clears throat> For when the Gentiles which don't have the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are law unto themselves, which show the work of the law that's written in their heart, their conscience bears witness. And their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. See, what you're going to be judged by? You're, you're going to be judged by that law of liberty that's on the inside of you. You're going to be judged by the freedom. Because he set you free. And when you get born again, the freedom isn't that you don't, it's not like, and it's not even going to be like this in heaven. How could it be? How could it be in heaven that you don't have choice when he gave you his blood to give you choice? See, he gave you choice. He set you free. And see, it's not going to be whether or not <laughs> there was sin that came to knocking on your door. It's who you listened to. Who did you give your ear to? See, that changes the way you live. People that progressively give their ear to the flesh, they walk away from the life of God, the law of life on the inside of them. Those people are not safe. And people that have the life of God on the inside of them, but they've been living for the flesh, if they progressively follow, they're going to be changed. Nathan is a perfect, perfect example of that. I mean, everybody that follows Christ is, but you can see more manifestly Nathan, who he used to be is not who he is now. Amen? I encourage you to come listen to him too. Let's go to one more. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. Chapter 
chapter 10. I'll start here in verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, meaning we all live in the flesh, okay? He's not talking about walking after the flesh. Though we all walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. That's not the fight we have. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. See, and in the Old Testament, they were natural strongholds. In the New Testament, they're not natural. What are these strongholds composed of? Thankfully, he tells us. Verse five. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Hmm. So in the Old Testament, the physical size and stature of their enemy, their sight, wasn't that what opposed them in the knowledge of God? That's what stood against them. Every high thing, whatever the high thing is that's opposing what God has told you to do is a high thing, all right? Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought, I say every thought, 95%? See, that's what we just read, isn't it? Thoughts being accused or excused. Look, the time to uproot sin is not when, (laughs) the time to uproot sin is when the thought comes across your mind. I've had the devil give me thoughts. They've been awful. Nope, I'm not gonna meditate on that. But see, every thought you meditate on grows. That's why it's about the thoughts, because it's in the heart. Nobody ends up killing somebody. Just it, It's a thought process that leads to it. Adultery, everything. Whatever, whatever kind of sin you want to talk about, all right? Maybe it's, maybe it's lust for an item. You know, I got to have the newest X, Y, Z. Starts as a thought. If you think about it all day, it's going to turn into an action. Okay? Every high thing. Now here, okay. The, the reverse of that, what should you be meditating on all day? The word of God. What does he say in Philippians? He says, be not drunk with wine, or as an excess, but be filled with the spirit, speaking to yourselves in ha- psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody unto the Lord. See, if you meditate on the word of God, see the picture there is a drunk person doesn't, doesn't sense things correctly. You don't want to be drunk and behind the wheel because they, their senses are not ready to do that, right? But what if you're drunk on the word of God? See, the idea is that those senses take some, in a, in a physical condition, your senses are subservient to the alcohol, the substance, and that's why it's not safe. But in a spiritual condition, your senses become subservient to the truth of the word of God when you're drunk on the word of God. That's the picture. Don't be drunk with wine. Be drunk on the word. Let those things come on the inside of you to the point that God is able to speak against every high thing, even if it's what you see, even if it's what you hear. See? That's the reverse. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Just take a second here. Some of the strongholds that my kids have, they're funny. Because I can look on the other side of them and I can see. You're free. You're fine. Nothing's wrong. Right? And and we we laugh I laugh at my kids' strongholds, but I wonder what God thinks about ours when we don't believe he can do such and such. Right? When we don't think, oh, you know, we get we get so excited we we got free from a cold, and he's like, what's a cold and cancer? They're all the same to him. It's no, I see you is just a, a status. God, it's all the same. 
if you're in the ICU. God isn't any more scared of the ICU than he is sitting in your home recovering from a cold. He's not afraid of that stuff. And until your ways become his ways, until your mind is transformed to see things like he sees things, it's hard for two to walk together if they don't agree. But he's wanting to bring us into agreement. He's wanting to change and transform our minds, right? <laughs> I remember some of the strongholds of my youth. I was afraid, I was deathly afraid of water. And my dad, I can still remember that coach trying to coax me out. I, st- I stood up there on that, on that um, what is that, diving platform, just a little thing for about 20 minutes, taking little steps. You remember that, Mom? Yeah. yeah. That was kind of embarrassing. but <laughs> I was so afraid of water because I hated getting it in my eyes and my face. My oldest, uh, I hope he listens to these someday. Um, my oldest, Josh, he's seven now. He's getting better, but haircuts is his kryptonite. <laughs> I mean, you might as well just strangle him. It's just about the same thing as how he acts. Because he just all over the place. And we tell him, Josh, keep your mouth closed. Keep your mouth closed. Because he's just crying and whining because we got a buzzer on his head, you know. He's much, he's much better. But, you know, the other two, they just sit there and look at him like, what you doing? <laughs> Marshall hop up in there and suck a lollipop while we're buzzing his head. But Josh is like, so he'll open his mouth and then he'll get hair in it and it's just bleh. We have to take him outside in the summer so he don't throw up in our house. <laughs> you give him a haircut. Everybody say stronghold. <laughs> so that's, what, that's what that'll, that'll do. You know, we're just, there's nothing wrong. You're free. <laughs> You've been freed. <laughs> we're giving you a haircut. Nothing's wrong. Yeah. So many little things like that. That's, that's how, that's what God is trying to renew our mind to. Look, these things are possible. Everybody say Possible. All things, let's all say that together. All things things are possible possible to me me because I believe. believe. See, it's the truth. And just, I can see it so plain, just like every every other stronghold in my life was lying about what was possible, so were the ones that I have facing me now. And they're bigger, praise God, that's the way they should be, but they're still lying to me. And you can beat them. Everybody say amen. 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 Well, Father, we're so grateful. Thank you for your word. I thank you that you've given us grace and strength in your spirit. You've given us more than just your life. You've also given us the Holy Ghost to lead us and guide us in things we don't understand or see. So, Father, we will not give you any more excuses about why we can't change this or why we're not free this way. We will stop complaining and excusing ourselves and we're going to trust what you said. We're going to trust what you said. Sin will not have dominion over us, nor will any unbelief, but we're going to be a people that believes and trusts and every single one of those things that Jesus said is going to apply to us. We're not going to doubt in our heart, but we're going to believe and everything we say, we're going to receive from our Father. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, amen. Amen. And God bless you guys. Have a good week.